OK, thank you, group three, for their presentation. Let's take a closer look at these questions. So the four named female characters in the film. Um, I think group three did a pretty good job of introducing these characters and describing them. Dolores is true that she is a very helpful and resourceful person, right? Her character is as the owner of the bar. So she's already a small business owner. And not only does she have control of her own life, she also has control over her love life. From the scene that group three played for us, we know that uh, Dolores and Valiant um, had a past. They were in a relationship together, uh, but apparently Eddie um, was like too poor or something. So they they kind of took a break from their relationship. And it does feel like Dolores is the one who dumped Eddie. So she has a she has standards for the kind of man that she wants to date. Um, so she's also in control of her love life. She, she doesn't depend on anyone, especially any man. So group three is right. She is the archetype of a, a strong and resourceful woman. And in fact, this makes the ending even more powerful. When Dolores is usually in control of her own life, and in the ending, things, things blow up and she starts to lose control, uh, that feels even more dangerous. And then at the very end, when she gets together with Eddie again, we know that she makes this choice based on the actions that she saw Eddie taking. She doesn't get back together with Eddie just because the film wants them to get together. Right? She made her own judgment, and it makes that ending, uh, her character being portrayed in this way, makes that ending feel more convincing. Betty Boop, the black and white sexy character, um, Group three says that uh, even though she doesn't have work, she's still a waitress. Like she's no longer acting, but she's still a waitress. And so she's still in financial control of her life. On the service, this does seem true, but that kind of service job is usually not the kind of job that uh, people can do for a long time. It's not usually like a career. So the fact that she's working in this kind of service job does not say good things about her future career planning. Um, and the group three mentioned that Betty Boop is still sexy. And, you know, that makes sense. But how does she feel about this? When she sees uh, her old friend Eddie show up, she tells him she still has it. And Eddie says, yeah, you do still have it. But did you notice his expression? Uh, he says, yeah, Betty, you do. He's being comforting. He's being like patronizing, or if you want to say it in a negative way, he's being condescending. He doesn't want to tell her uh, how he really feels. So even though uh, he has known, for, known her for a long time, they're good friends, even he feels like maybe Betty Boop is no longer the typical uh, sexy cartoon character. Times have changed. And so as Group 3 says, this is a good uh, metaphor or allegory for how the society, a patriarchal society, treats uh, women's beauty, especially the entertainment industry. Um, it's quite obvious that in the entertainment industry, such as Hollywood, does not have a lot of opportunities for middle-aged and older women. Most of the like uh, TV characters you see or like the movie actresses, 
most of them are relatively young and and relatively attractive women. So when the standards of beauty change, then previously famous or well-off actresses or entertainers may suddenly find themselves out of a job, out of a career. Uh, and as Group 3 mentioned, the film uses the transition from black and white to color as an example of when the standards change. Uh, and I agree with them that this is quite a clever way to do this because everybody agrees that color cartoons are more popular today than black and white cartoons. There's very little space for a subjective determination. Do you prefer black and white? Do you prefer color? Very few people think about this question. Most people just think, oh, color is better. Uh, and so this is a much clearer way to show changing standards than saying like, oh, in that period, uh, this kind of female body shape was more popular. And in this period, this kind of shape is more popular. That would be more subjective. It would be more open to debate, but from black and white to color, it's a very clear trend. So that's a very good way of doing that. Um, so it does seem like Betty Boop is not doing too well. She has some confidence issues as well. Later in that scene, right, when they're watching Jessica Rabbit perform, we also have a shot of Betty Boop feeling jealous. She's looking at Eddie and she feels jealous because Eddie is just entranced by Jessica Rabbit. Um, so we know that Betty Boop is not feeling very secure in her career. Uh, right, so Jessica Rabbit, Group 3 did a good job here as well, pointing out that she's portrayed as sexy and therefore kind of dangerous. In fact, this is a type of film character called the femme fatale. This is French, meaning dangerous woman. So especially in like crime movies, police detective movies, there will often be a woman who is portrayed as sexy and also kind of threatening. Now, these two things do not have to be related. Just because she's sexy does not mean that she must be dangerous. Just because she's dangerous does not mean she has to be sexy. But in these kinds of movies, both ideas are presented in the same character. And therefore, these two ideas are connected. Uh, and this is why uh, in popular culture today, sometimes when we see a person, especially a woman who is very sexy, uh, there the the content like the film or the TV show might be also treating her as kind of dangerous. This is where that idea comes from. Now, why would beauty be linked to danger? That's kind of strange, right? Well, there's an idea in philosophy that beauty is kind of. Well, Kant called it transcendental, which means it's not exactly part of this world or sublime. It expands. It doesn't fit into everyday experience. When you face true beauty, like a piece of art or like a beautiful natural scene or yes, even a beautiful person, sometimes that beauty doesn't fit in your everyday experience. You can't take in all of this beauty at once. It, it makes your brain kind of go haywire. You can only stare and admire, kind of like how Eddie just like looks at Jessica uh, performing and he, he can't react in any way. So from that point of view, beauty can be a sign of losing control. And therefore, if a beautiful person makes you lose control, then they have the control. Uh, and if you can't trust them, that could be dangerous. So the idea of beauty and danger has some philosophical connection. 
But finally, why is it specifically a dangerous woman? Why not a dangerous, handsome man? Well, if you think about it, there's a lot of literature and films with dangerous, handsome men, right? If you think about any of the villains or any of the like backstabbers, most of them are handsome. And in fact, there is the idea that you might be tricked by a man because he's too handsome. You start to trust him and it turns out he's a terrible guy. So the reason why the femme fatale is a woman is because this is unusual. It's one of the uncommon times when a woman character is given power and agency and control. Uh, and then finally, this is linked back to uh, the idea that traditionally movies have been made for men or made by men. The perspective of most traditional films is a male perspective. We're seeing the world of the film from a man's point of view. Uh, and so what could be more scary for a man than realizing that this woman you don't trust has power over you? Especially a man who is used to living in a patriarchal society where he always has some level of control. Um, so that's why Jessica Rabbit looks like that. She is drawn bad. She is drawn as a femme fatale. Now, at this point, the femme fatale character is very familiar. We know that in uh, this kind of movie, when you have this kind of woman, she could be dangerous. So the film has to have Jessica Rabbit actively work against this stereotype. She has to show that she is trustworthy. Um, and even in the scene that Group 3 just played for us, when she's telling Eddie, I'm not a bad person, her behavior still feels like it, he, she's trying to manipulate him, right? She's like walking around very sexy. When she approaches him, her body touches his body. Um, so like even when she's telling him, don't worry about me, I'm on your side, her behavior feels untrustworthy. But all of this is related to as she says, this is how her character was created. This is the stereotype she has to fight against. Uh, and as Group 3 showed us in the end, the only way she could really gain Eddie's trust is by saving his life. And then finally, Lena Hyena. Lena Hyena, this character can only be understood if you think about her on top of the femme fatale. If the femme fatale is a woman using her sexual power to gain control over a man and therefore make the man feel danger, Lena Hyena, uh, her character is exactly the same except without the sexy part. So like traditionally, if a man kind of falls for a femme fatale, falls for a dangerous woman, yeah, he's probably going to get killed, but at least he can enjoy her beauty. There's like a kind of trade there. Um, there's a reason he is attracted to her, a reason that he's put in danger. But for uh, a character like Lena Haina, this is another stereotype. Um, and it's quite a misogynistic stereotype. It's very unfair to women. And the idea is a woman. Uh, every woman, or I should say most women, have sexual desires. But in a patriarchal society, in order to satisfy those desires, a woman has to be able to give something to men in return. So for the femme fatale, if she wants to have control over a man, she has to be sexy for him. There's an exchange. But for 
the character of Lena Haina, that character type, she has nothing to offer men. She is not traditionally beautiful. She is not. Uh, she this kind of character is usually not rich, usually is not polished, doesn't have a lot of culture. She is structured around her desire only. And so in patriarchal culture, this kind of character is a joke. The idea that um, any woman, like a woman with nothing special going on, has desires and that this is okay. This idea does not fit in a patriarchal ideology because it does nothing for men. Um, so as group three pointed out, not only is Lena Haina very aggressive, she is presented in an ugly way, right? She doesn't take care of her. Uh, she doesn't um, treat her body in a way that would make it look sexier for men. She doesn't wear uh, sex, uh, entirely sexy clothing in, for male perspective. Um, so that's the kind of character that Lena Haina is. Question two uh, about other cartoon characters and their stereotypes. Uh, so first I want to say the second example that Group 3 gave us, Baby Herman, was spot on, right? Looks like a baby, performs like a baby, turns out he's a 50-year-old. Uh, we call that... Um, uh, I can't remember the word. Fresh. He's a fresh man, which means he likes to uh, sexually harass women. Right, we see him uh, harass the woman on the set walking under her dress. We see him slap the butt of the woman who's, I guess, his assistant. Um, so this is another, if, if you ignore the baby part, right, the, the personality is also a stereotype. The idea that um, all men want to be able to do whatever they want to women, and the only thing stopping them is society. So when a man gets powerful enough, he gets to treat women however he wants. This is also a traditional stereotype. Uh, of course, it's not true that men have no control over their desire. Or it shouldn't be true. Men should have control over their sexual desire. Uh, and it's not true that only external factors limit men's behavior. Uh, it is a reflection of personal morality. But in a heavily patriarchal culture, such as the entertainment industry, um, it does seem to attract a disproportionate number of sexist men. And so Baby Herman is that kind of stereotype. Uh, so that's Baby Herman. Now we can go back to Roger Rabbit. Yes, he is a typical crowd-pleasing cartoon character full of laughter and joy, and he's also kind of stupid. All that is true. But why is he a rabbit? Why not some other kind of animal? Why not a human? So there are some ideas connected to rabbits, right? Yes, they're cute and cute and fluffy. That's true. But they're also kind of easily scared, especially wild rabbits. Or I mean, even pet rabbits are easily scared. You do something unusual and they kind of get scared and they hide. Uh, it's even possible to scare a rabbit to death. You can give them a heart attack by like scaring them uh, too strongly. So we can see some of these traits on Roger Rabbit as well. He's often quite scared. Uh, whether he's scared that he's losing his wife, or he's scared that he's being set up for murder, or he's scared that like Doctor or Judge Doom is hunting him. The film makes him easily scared, but it also puts him in situations that are quite scary. Uh, so that's how the film uses the rabbit stereotype for him. And then finally, the way that he dresses, loud colors, red, yellow, blue. He dresses like a clown, especially like the big shoes, right? 
So that's also a stereotype that he makes use of. He is, in fact, a clown. A clown is an entertainer that uh, makes themselves the joke in order to get other people to laugh. That's what Roger Rabbit does, right? He gets hit. He suffers. He does stupid stuff all so that people will laugh. So he is, in fact, literally a clown. We can also talk about some other characters, the weasels, Judge Doom's henchmen, the, the animals in the suits with the guns. Weasels are traditionally uh, animals with a negative stereotype because they steal grain from farms. Like, you know, when you harvest the wheat and you put it, uh, store it up, weasels will steal grain, weasels will steal small, steal like small animals. Um, so they are also traditionally not. Uh, they don't have good PR. They don't have a good image. And so the film uses that to make them the villains. And in fact. Judge Doom wants to destroy all cartoons. The weasels are cartoons, and yet the weasels support Judge Doom. So they're so evil that they don't even work for their own interest. Um, let's see, what other cartoon characters do we have? I mean, I think those are the major ones, right? Judge Doom is a cartoon character, but we don't find out until the very end. So I guess that doesn't really count. Uh, well, I mean, he I guess Judge Doom kind of fits between question two and question three, right? Question three is question two is like we talk about the cartoon characters. Question three is about the live action characters. Uh, and group three did not really answer this question. So the question is uh, second half. Does the film make its live action elements more cartoonish? If yes, how? If no, why not? And I think their answer is that the film does not make its live action elements more cartoonish. Uh, and then they went on to say, well, how can we make it more cartoonish? Which is not exactly what the question is asking. So let's talk about this together. Um, at first, we think Judge Doom is quite cartoonish, right? Dressed all in black black round sunglasses. He has that cane. He's a walking stereotype of a movie villain. Uh, so it kind of makes sense at the end when he, it's revealed that he's actually a cartoon. Well, I guess this still counts, right? Because the actor playing Judge Doom is a real person. Uh, so like the way that he dresses, the way that he talks and behaves makes him seem more like a cartoon. Which in the movie he turn it turns out he is a cartoon. Um, let's see. Well, what about Eddie? Eddie usually seems like a pretty normal guy, but when he's interacting with cartoons, right? We just saw a scene where uh, he discovers Roger Rabbit in his room, and he's trying to grab this rabbit and trying to throw him out. And they have like a fight, a small fight. And I don't know if you noticed this, but like Roger Rabbit, for most of that fight, does not get hurt. It's usually Eddie when he's like jumping to grab the rabbit or like something like happens, he gets the wrong direction. And then he hits himself or he falls down. In fact, in that scene, the real cartoon is Eddie. He's the one treated like a cartoon. It's only at the very end when Roger Rabbit is like grabbing on the door and Eddie is trying to pull him away. Only there do we see how the rabbit is uh, follows cartoon physics. Then we also have like uh, the. Well, who else do we have? Like the characters at the bar, right? All of those men who are there drinking. When Eddie goes there for the first time in the movie, people laugh at him. They kind of joke about him. Uh, and, you know, that behavior to me also seems kind of cartoonish, especially that one guy, right? Um, 
the one guy who laughs at Eddie for helping cartoon characters. Uh, his laughter, his behavior also to me seems like a cartoon. So the movie doesn't just make cartoon characters more realistic. There are certain places where real people also feel kind of like cartoons. And that's why the film feels like it goes together. It feels coherent because both sides approach the middle. Number four, does the film's plot and or characters draw on historical parallels? If so, how, if no, why not? So group three found one, which is that uh, putting all the cartoons in the same place in the city is a kind of segregation. And in the US between 1876 and 1965, there were a set of laws, especially in the Southern US, but not only in the Southern US, there were a set of laws that separated white people from usually black people, but also like other races if they were not considered white. And the idea is there are some places only white people could go. There are some things only white people could do. And black people and other minorities can go to different but similar places and do different but similar things. Now, usually, in fact, even though they were similar, the quality was far lower. In fact, in this film, we don't even need the allegory. There is one scene where cartoons are specifically banned. The restaurant or like the, the where Jessica Rabbit performs, right? Uh, no tunes allowed. There's a sign on the door. Humans only. Uh, and then, like, when we talk to the movie studio boss, uh, he says it's great working for cartoons because they can't get hurt. You don't have to pay for hospital insurance. And also for Dumbo, the flying elephant, he works for peanuts, not for money. So it's, it's cheaper. Uh, so it does seem like one reason the movie studio likes working with cartoons is not because they make better movies. It's not because this is what the audience wants, simply because they're cheaper. Or you could say they're easier to exploit. By the way, to work for peanuts is an English phrase that means to work for very little money. So it's a joke. Um, so that's one historical parallel, right? Treating cartoons as separate but equal to live humans. But there, there are two more significant historical parallels in the film. One is Judge Doom. His character is someone who hates cartoon characters, wants to destroy all cartoon characters, wants to get rid of Toontown. He's a Nazi. He dresses in all black like the uh, Nazi SS uh, elite army unit, which is actually not that elite. They're just more scary and have darker uniform. The Nazis actually sucked at war. This is this should be obvious, right? The Nazis lost World War II. They are not a strong and powerful army. Um, and then also, like, the way Judge Doom has no empathy at all for cartoons, even though he himself is a cartoon, right? The way that he destroyed that cartoon shoe was so heartbreaking. Like, the shoe kept on squeaking, like, save me, save me. It feels like the this, this shoe is squeaking, save me. And he just dunks the thing in the dip and it dissolves. Just really scary stuff. And yet he himself is a cartoon. And it feels like this is an example of the self-hating Jew character. The idea is during Nazi Germany, some Jewish people sided with the Nazis in order to protect themselves. And a very, very small number sided with the Nazis because they hated their own culture and their own people. So it's not as simple as, oh, if you're a Jewish person, then you're against the Nazis. Sometimes they felt like they had no choice. And very rarely you had a few Jewish people who actively agreed with the Nazis. 
So Judge Doom does seem to be this last group of people, right? He is himself a cartoon. It seems like he doesn't want to be a cartoon. It seems like he hates the idea of being a cartoon. And so his mission in life is to destroy his own, uh, let's call it his own race of cartoon characters. And the third major historical parallel is uh, Judge Doom's plan to destroy Toontown is to build a highway right through the middle. This is similar to things that the American government did in the early 20th century, especially under the influence of the architect Robert Moses. Robert Moses believed that uh, cars were the future. Cities should be built for cars. And so you need space for highways. Well, where do you get the space? You can't destroy white neighborhoods. So instead, they decided to destroy black neighborhoods, minority neighborhoods. The excuse was that they said these neighborhoods were dirtier, messier, had more crime. But why were they dirtier, messier? Why did they have more crime? Because they had fewer resources. Because the government spent less money giving them police officers, giving them public facilities, giving them adequate sanitation. So of course, it, it felt like black communities were worse because the government created them that way. Or not actively created. The government often instituted policies where, again, white only white people can live here, or uh, if white people live here, they get lower rent. And so these policies kind of put black people and minorities into worse parts of the city. So very conveniently, when you need space to build a highway, destroy these ugly communities. And so throughout the United States, including in California, there are many examples of traditionally black and minority neighborhoods either divided by a large highway that they can't walk across or just simply destroyed to build the highway and to build like a strip mall or like another suburban area redevelopment. And this is why even today in the United States, urban renewal, 都市更新, is often a negative concept. Like in Taiwan, we often think urban new renewal. Okay, cool. This place looks ugly. Let's tear it down, rebuild it to make it look better. In Taiwan, if a some if somebody lives there and they the government says we want to renew this place, the government has to give them a place to stay while it's being rebuilt and has to give them a new place in the new area. In the United States, there was no such requirement. When the government thought this place looks ugly, let's rebuild it, they could just kick people out of their homes. This, in US law, this is called eminent domain, which means the government has the final say in, or I should say, the government has the right to take land and property if it is for public benefit. And so the government often said, we're making this place look better. That's a public benefit. So we have the right to just take your land, take your property. And no surprise, the US government often did this more to black people and minorities and only very rarely to white people. Um, so that's another major historical parallel in this film. And finally, uh, as an allegory for queer people and communities, Group 3 gave us some attributes about uh, queer people and communities. It's not mainstream. It's more multicultural and diverse. And these ideas are generally true, but I think they kind of miss the point. So let's take a look at this. In week one, I introduced some basic gender and sexuality ideas. And when we were talking about third wave feminism, I pointed out that this includes queer activism. And so we talked a little bit about what this means. 
queer activism, people who support uh, the idea of queer sexual desire, acknowledge that everybody's body is different, everybody's sexual desire is different. And so instead of trying to make people fit certain ideas, instead, the idea of queer activism celebrates this difference. Your body is different from mine? Great. Your body is different from everybody else's? Wonderful. Uh, so celebrating diverse genders, bodies, sexual desires, and saying, you don't have to be ashamed of this. It's perfectly natural. Um, so from this point of view, this does tend to mean that some queer people's ideas about genders, bodies, and sexual desires are not mainstream. Uh, today, especially today in conservative societies like Taiwan or, yes, even the US, many parts of the US are very conservative. Uh, these ideas are still very strange, right? There are still there's still a dominant idea of what a man should be like, what a woman should be like, what is the so-called proper way to have sex. So these ideas will naturally, as a matter of course, be outside of the mainstream of these societies. But that's not the definition. It's just something that happens because of the definition. Uh, and then, yes, it is about diversity, but I don't know if it's about, well, you can say it's about multiculturalism. Um, again, that's kind of secondary. It's not the key aspect of uh, queer culture and queer communities, but it is true that people from different cultural backgrounds and different races will have different ideas about gender and sexuality. And so uh, multiculturalism and multiracialism can be part of queer activism. So this is the second point, keeping open to future developments. If you meet somebody from a country you've never been to and that you've never met anybody from there before, like Kazakhstan, Hazaku, and their ideas of love and romance and sex are very different from yours, that's fine. That's great. More difference, more uh, ways of looking at the world. So it is possible for uh, culture and race to be queer. It's not essential, but it's possible. And in fact, I would say likely. Um, so if the essence of queerness is difference, think about the cartoon characters in this film. We've already talked about some aspects of sexual desire among them, such as uh, Jessica Rabbit is drawn as a sexy femme fatale, but she's not really, right? She's a woman who loves her husband and is forced to do something by evil people. But what is she forced to do? In a regular film, she would be forced to have sex with someone else. But in this film, they don't have sex. They play patty cake, which is like a drinking game. You see them play it in the movie, right? Uh, and this is seen as a major betrayal of Roger Rabbit. That's also kind of queer, right? Uh, it's kind of like their version of a deeply romantic and intimate activity such as sex. Now you can say they had to do it this way because the movie is also for kids, and that's true, but there could have been other ways to do this. You could have not shown the activity at all. You can use hints, suggestions, and innuendo. And You didn't have to actually give us something, but the film does give us patty cake. So that's kind of queer. Um, we also have like cartoon characters that have like like the two ducks, right? Uh, the performance before the rabbit, you had Donald Duck and Daffy Duck. Uh, I don't know if this is important, but one white duck, one black duck. 
um, performing with each other against each other. They perform like they're enemies, but it seems quite clear that they enjoy working together. They enjoy fighting like this. That's also quite a different relationship. Of course, in real life, you also have friends who like to argue uh, and who enjoy arguing with each other, but usually they don't argue for their career. They don't do it as their job. And usually they aren't uh, put on stage to perform for an entirely different crowd of people. Right? These are two cartoons performing for human people in a place where cartoons are not allowed to be customers. So this relationship to me also feels kind of queer. Doesn't mean they're gay. It just means that their relationship does seem uh, quite unique, quite unusual. And that's a good thing, right? It's always good to see different kinds of male bonding, especially um, because usually in a patriarchal society, uh, men are expected to be a certain kind of way, and that certain kind of way excludes uh, overly intimate behavior with other men because uh, patriarchal cultures are often also homophobic cultures. If the end result of patriarchy, or sorry, if the stated goal of patriarchy is to um, self-perpetuate, to continue forever in the future, then you need to have the next generation of men in order to continue this culture. Uh, so the idea that two people could be in a sexual relationship not for producing children uh, goes against that ideology, whether it's gay men or gay women. Gay women tend to be treated slightly uh, differently because some men feel that the taboo of uh, against lesbians can be kind of sexy. But men, straight men, usually don't think that gay men are sexy. Uh, so that doesn't mean that lesbians are treated better under a patriarchy. It's not necessarily better to be treated as existing only for men's sexual pleasure. Um, but there is this difference in treatment. Um, so the fact that the two ducks are male and they have this very interesting friendship and business relationship, basically a relationship, I think that fits the idea of uh, like a, a queer relationship. Okay, do you guys have questions or thoughts about this movie? Okay, so um, next week we're watching another movie. Where is group four? Yeah, so next week's movie is your movie. Yeah, okay. Uh, and so I wanted to give you a few reminders. Um, first of all, remember to actually answer the question, right? Be careful about what is the question asking. If you are unsure, you can uh, give, send me an email and we can talk about it. Also, um, it's good to give examples from the film, but remember to explain your examples. Group three did this quite well, right? They said, oh, something, something, and then they presented the evidence for those ideas. Um, but you can explain your examples before or after or, in fact, I think it would be best to explain it before and after. Um, and um, if you have more than one example for the same point, you don't have to use all of them. OK? OK, and remember to practice. Like, uh, I think it's fine if you want to ask ChatGPT for help, but the ideas should be your ideas, and you should make them sound like your ideas. So practice. OK. Um, that's it for today. If you want to discuss this with me further, I am here. Uh, otherwise, please come on time next week to watch the movie.